Mr. Andrew Correll, how you doing today, sir? Ah, pretty good, Joey. How about yourself? Andrew, I'm doing all right. I have to know before we get into it, this is an important question. What's something that you felt before, like pre-pandemic, that was borderline questionable in terms of sanitary behavior? Now, like mid-pandemic, what's something that is just completely like unacceptable now that you still see in, in terms of like just like sanitary behavior? Oh, I, I was a chronic kind of face toucher. My glasses, I'm always adjusting them or, you know, maybe taking something off my nose. Um, that, you know, is, is one of those things where, yeah, pre-pandemic, it was something that I kind of thought about. And then now with the focus on washing hands, not touching your face, you know, it's something that, that now I'm just off of cold turkey. Yeah, I mean, definitely like the the hand of the mouth, like any sort of excessive like touching. But for me, Andrew, I don't know about you, it's uh, loose silverware. I didn't think that was like, I mean, before it was oh, yeah. it was pretty barbaric to me. But even now, it's like, dude, you're gonna just hand me like some silverware and like a paper bag? Like, what are we doing here? Like, this is come on, are we aware no, no. of the situation? There's no. I way need it know. sealed in plastic now, please. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, sealed in plastic, and maybe even just put some uh, pure all over the top of it. Every there you day. go. So, you know, so it's nice and sanitary <laughs> when I open it. But, you know, in all honesty, I mean, in terms of, you know, what are you looking at? I mean, because you have some, you know, conversations across the industry. What are you seeing in terms of maybe behavior that has been traditionally sort of installed in, in insurance and, and, you know, you're focused on trying to you know, look at different, look, look at things differently. What's something that you sort of see that has maybe made that night and day shift to where we're a little more aware of things than, than we were before based on our current environment? Yeah, I would say kind of shifting behaviors has been around the face-to-face meeting. Insurance has primarily been an in-person, shake hands, sit down at the same table uh, type of business when it comes to insurance agencies and uh, companies looking for insurance. Now with, with where we're at, having to make that shift, some agencies had been doing that pre-pandemic and were already starting to work more digital digital interactions into their, their sales cycles. And you know, back in March for a lot of the country, it kind of shifted very quickly where in, in-person meetings were no longer allowed and seeing the, the transition and just the, the increased comfort level around doing business virtually and not being, you know, on the golf course at a lunch in a boardroom uh, has been, has been really great to see. Yeah, it's that whole uh, sort of shifting the arena of where relationships are sort of built and nurtured and things. And for, for me, it was always the, you know, you might have an agent that was receptive to the ideas, but even then on the client side of things, they still had a, a ways to go in terms of wanting to maybe get on a video call with their agent. And, and so I think both sides are now maybe equally prepared to, to handle that. Is there some sort of acceleration or, or I guess, best practice to maybe maintaining those relationships more effectively? Yeah, I would say just more open communication, um, you know, almost over over communication to agree to a degree, you know, before so much communication was done via nonverbal communication, reading intonations and things like that. And so now just being more overt with what you're communicating, thinking more about how that might sound to to somebody on the other end. Uh, has been been really key. You know, it's been there's been a learning curve for everybody. You know, I've had the the luxury of working remote for the last five years, um, but but some of my colleagues had been in in the office every day, and so you know, kind of being there to to kind of talk them through that transition has been helpful. And yeah, it's just been you know kind of trial and error. Um, I think everyone's been just a lot nicer. These days, uh, more understanding with uh, just everything that's been going on, having kids at home, um, having the family in one place. Um, so I, I think the the level of friendship and warmth has, has really helped as well. Yeah, I mean, you have a lot of experience in, in the underwriting world. Is that correct? I mean, you've 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 definitely seen your fair share of things. What what is what's going on over there? What do you what do you anticipate in terms of you know just the appetite, the overall way people are viewing business and, and what you're, you know, what agents are bringing, what, you know, carriers are wanting um, and, and where maybe might be some interesting places to, to pay attention to that, that agents maybe have neglected in the past. So I've noticed a lot of disruption in the marketplace. My expertise has been 
on the, the technology side. So I work primarily with technology focused companies and with that on their errors and emissions and cyber liability coverage. And so I've seen a lot of disruption in the marketplace uh, with the really steep increase in ransomware and other cyber events, both from a frequency perspective, a uh, number of occurrences that have been happening. You know, it's every, every day, almost every week, you're seeing something new in the news about another company, another, another entity, another government falling victim to an attack. And then also just the, the amount of dollars that those ransomware events um, are costing. And so that's causing a number of carriers to either retreat on limits that they're offering, maybe requiring more stringent controls, um, different terms of conditions, higher retentions, et cetera. And so from the agency perspective, it's now more important than ever for insurance agents to be involved and knowledgeable about what makes a good risk. And by that, I mean attitude and, and just a mindset towards risk management before, you know, you would hear some symptom, sentiment around, well, I've got insurance coverage, so I'm good, right? We're, we're quickly seeing now that, that insurance is not, you know, a back, it's a backstop, but it's not, you know, a form of control, you know, at your home, you wouldn't say, well, I've got smoke detector, you know, I've, I've got homeowner's insurance, so I don't need smoke detectors or, or fire extinguishers or an escape plan because insurance is going to take care of me. You know, that would be, that would be almost foolish. Um, and so we're starting to see that carry over into the ENO and the cyber world where it's more important now for the agents to know and be that trusted advisor to say, you know, hey, here's what I'm seeing in the marketplace. Here's how we can make you a better risk um, to find the, those better terms and conditions, the pricing that's available. The insurance market still wants to ensure good risks and it will be, you know, incumbent upon everybody to work together uh, to find a better solution for that. Yeah, you mentioned, you know, when you see a lot of claims go up, right, then you never really want to say the words underpriced insurance to anybody because uh, people, you know, might get violent with that sort of response. But in reality, that is the case. You find that out pretty quickly when things start to happen. And I feel like that's an area that it's, it's definitely true. Do you think that there's some sort of reckoning in terms of where pricing is and what people need to start to expect in terms of insurance when they do see a lot, large number of claims and, and maybe from the agent side of things, you know, communicating that a little bit better and maybe sort of setting expectations like, listen, this is, this is the actual dollars and cents, the nuts and bolts of this. I believe so. Yeah. I, I've seen that across the marketplace over the last 12 to 18 months where the new business that I'm seeing is you know facing a 10 to 15 to 20 percent increase in, in in pricing you know and that is not well our sales went up so our insurance is going to be more expensive these are just pure rating factors that are that are going into that so yeah i i definitely feel that in the marketplace the agents that i've worked with primarily are really good on working with insurance carriers that understand how to price um, this business appropriately, you know, because there have been some carriers that saw the writing on the wall 12 to 18 months ago. Back then you would hear, oh, you, you guys are too expensive. Um, you know, we're going with these other markets. Uh, we're getting the same coverage, uh, relatively speaking. And it's, it's so much uh, more, more affordable. And so now fast forward, you know, those same carriers are not taking the types of increases, the types of, you know, drastic action um, that, that others in the market are seeing. Agents that, that understand that and are working with their insurance to see the value in what's brought, not just in the insurance coverage, but what kind of add-on benef benefits are, are available? Are there, there are people that they can work with to make them a better risk, uh, increase their risk management posture. Is their claims department experienced when it comes to a cyber event? More so than in other lines of business, when a cyber event occurs, you know, time is money. The quicker that you get working on that, um, the, the better the outcome for everybody. And so now we're starting to see with the, the disruption in the marketplace, um, who really knows tech, you know, and cyber the best. And we're starting to see business flow to those carriers. 
I don't know if you have an answer to this. I'm going to give it a shot anyways, Andrew, but is there something as an underwriter that you felt like you, if you could just say this to the client, like skip through the agent, like, yo, this is the thing that, you know, is there something that like that you kind of felt like you were held back on in like the communication chain that you, you really just felt needed to be said that that never got there? Yeah. You know, the conversations that I've had with both agents and insureds um, has always been around housekeeping, right? If you can mitigate the risk as best as possible, because in this space, there is no true prevention. These measures and defenses that you put in place are similar to like your home. You have an alarm system, right? It's not foolproof, but it's much better than having nothing in place, right? You become a bigger target without these controls in place. So having that conversation that, you know, cybersecurity is not an expense, right? It's an investment in, in your future, right? Some people that look at that as, oh, well, you know, they're, they're making me install a firewall. They're making me do this and see it as an expense. Those are the ones who have the toughest time recovering from an event because their, their recovery plans are not tested. But the, the insureds who have a really solid stance on taking this seriously, looking at it like it's an investment in their company and their future and not just something that, that somebody's making them buy, generally have the, the best outcomes. And so the conversations that I've had where that really resonates with everybody involved, those are the ones that if they do have a claim, you know, their recovery time is drastically reduced versus somebody who just said, well, I've got insurance in place, so that's good enough. Um, those are the ones that, that have, um, that can really feel the outcomes of that. Speaking of other conversations, you also like to talk about, uh, you know, forward thinking insurance on the internet as well in the form of podcasts, which I have to be a fan of as well. I mean, tell me about those conversations. I mean, what stands out from that, you know, in, in comparison to, you know, the day-to-day -day underwriting thing that, you know, what, what do you see as like, hey, really, we need to get here. We need to do this. This is important. We need to be paying attention. Yes. So I've been most happy to just have confirmation that, Insurers, especially tech startups, really care about security, really care about risk management, right? I've, I've yet to talk to a business owner that didn't want to do good. They care about being a good business and staying in business for the long haul. I've also heard that the insurance buying experience by and large um, is not something that they would like to see continue. Tech startups build fast. They build digitally and they utilize data that's available from multiple sources. And so that's what they're used to. And when you go to buy insurance, right, that experience doesn't always line up, right? There are 10, 15 page PDF documents that you're filling out, sometimes per line of business. The turnaround time is days, if not weeks. In those conversations, I've heard wanting to work with agencies and insurance carriers that value that digital transformation, really honing in on what is needed to know versus nice to know, um, creating experiences that are streamlined and available online, and also just rethinking the way that insurance questions are asked and tailoring them to a specific risk, right? So if you look at some insurance carriers applications, they're gonna be the same ones that they use for an enterprise company that has a thousand employees and startups that maybe have five. But you and I know, and I think everybody would understand that those two companies are fundamentally different. To have them go through the same experience, you know, is that the best version of it? Or is there a way that we can tailor that to a specific company and understand really what is driving their exposures and their risk and in formatting the questions to, to address those. Yeah, we're definitely big fans of eliminating or limiting underwriting questions. Do you think, is there a point of uh, no return? Like how far can we push it? Like in terms of, you know, what information we truly need? I mean, what have you seen? Where does it get too risky versus, you know, again, streamlining that process? Right. So I think it, it boils down to truly understanding where claims come from. So when you think of cybersecurity, one of the fundamentals that I see is enabling multi-factor or two-factor authentication. It's not a 
it's not a perfect pill and it will not prevent 100% of claims, but the claims that we do see arise in this space, many of them could have been prevented or at least mitigated some of the severity on those. So questions like that. But when you get to questions uh, like, how many records do you do you hold? If I know that I'm underwriting a business to business firm that doesn't do business with the general public, that doesn't host any personally identifiable inf- information, do I really need to ask that question? Right? Is it getting to a fundamental risk exposure of that company? And if the answer is no, then that is a type of question that I can, can erase from my application. And so having a dynamic application, you know, there are platforms out there that can skim an insurance website and give you a good idea of what they do. And so if I can get that ahead of time, and I know that, well, maybe they don't have any exposure to healthcare or they're not an e-commerce site. There's a lot of questions that I could probably eliminate asking yourself, well, if those tools are available, you know, maybe we should be looking at utilizing some of those things to answer some of the questions that we have before we even talk to the insured and only asking them things specific to their, their existence and their experience that will help us better uh, craft an insurance policy for them. Are you optimistic that we will be soon living in that sort of dynamic future? I am. Um, you know, I'm seeing a lot of, of companies moving towards that. You know, so here in Austin, um, a good buddy of mine, Dave Perez, runs an insurance agency called Lumen Insurance Technologies. And so he focuses only on technology startups. And he has crafted his agency experience from the bottom up with that experience in mind. Um, gathering data that is available from public sources, making their application process seamless, having them fill out something online and only once that's able to port that information over to the various applications that he might be using for different insurance carriers. And then companies like Vouch Insurance are really reimagining how technology startups buy insurance and and work through that process and what's really needed to to get to the the real um, the underlying causes and and only asking those those things that are really required rather than you know questions that that might be nice to know as an underwriter you know I'm guilty of that on the underwriting side I like to know everything but it's a discipline to understand well maybe I don't need to know that so I'm just gonna have to kind of trust my my instinct and understand that these are the, you know, five or six things that I do need to know and focus on those. All right, Andrew, I got three more questions for you, sir. And most simply, uh, what's one thing that you hope you never forget? One thing I hope I never forget, um, paying it forward. When I came into the insurance industry, I didn't have any experience in insurance. You know, I studied economics in college and came out and, you know, as I could either go to graduate school for more economics education um, or, or insurance was uh, something that, that kind of uh, piqued my interest. So I got into insurance and, you know, had the most amazing mentors um, right, right out of the gate. And so that taught me that, you know, I, I want to do that now that I'm, you know, eight to 10 years in my career now, never forgetting that I got here because people took it upon themselves to, to mentor me and educate me. And so never forgetting that is, is something that I'm focused on. All right. On the other side of that, what's uh, one thing you still have yet to learn, Andrew? Oh, you name it. You know, there's always things that you can get better at. You know, we I, we just talked about need to know versus nice to know. Those are things that I haven't perfected yet. As the risk landscape evolves, um, there's always something to learn. Um, you know, 24, 36 months ago, ransomware, we knew what it was. It wasn't to the scale that it is today. And so there's always something new to learn in that space. And who knows what we're going to be talking about in another 24 to 36 months, probably something that, that we either aren't paying attention to or, or hasn't even been thought of yet. So, you know, the, the sky's the limit there. All right, Andrew, last question. If I were to hand you a magic wand of sorts to reshape, change, alter, speed up, make better, use whatever adjective you like, insurance in any way, shape or form, what is that thing? Where is it going and what is it doing? I think that utilizing more and more publicly available data, implementing 
solutions that are around machine learning, artificial intelligence to make the underwriting process easier. And so as an underwriter, you may be thinking like, well, well that, that's just going to eliminate your job, isn't it? Not necessarily, right? There's still a human element that's needed. And utilizing these types of solutions allows me to focus on what my human brain does the best and eliminates those tasks that are better suited for, for computers. And so continued adoption and moving toward a model where humans can utilize their brain to do what it does best, that's where I ultimately see um, insurance and underwriting going. Andrew, this has been fantastic. So I'm going to leave it right there. Awesome.